Good morning, everyone, and happy Saturday. My name is Callie, and this is another weekend of Clarinets, Cats, and Coffee. In today's video, I just played for you an unaccompanied piece by Wilson Osborne called Rhapsody for B-flat clarinet. This is a great piece if you are looking for an introduction to 20th century unaccompanied music. I say a great introductory piece because it's fairly straightforward. You don't have to do any extended technique and it's a pretty clear musical story from start to finish and I find it pretty palatable when it comes to the harmonic melodic progression of the entire piece. So it's kind of fun to play and there are some cool little um, melodic bits in here. I mean, you just heard me play it, so you can judge for yourself. So if you're preparing this piece, there are a few things that you wanna keep in mind. And this is, in my opinion, pretty general that you could actually apply to any kind of contemporary or 20th century music that you are learning. One, pay very close attention to the instructions written in the music. 20th century, 21st century composers tend to be very specific about what they want. And this piece, when I first had to learn it, when I was a teenager, I was kind of overwhelmed with all of the musical terms and all of the instructions kind of written in into the piece. So take your time, look up the musical terms that you may not know and write it down. I actually had to color code mine and uh, because the tempo changes so frequently um, to, you know, know when to speed up and when to slow down. And I found it very helpful to use my metronome to try to stay somewhat in the ballpark of the tempo markings that Osborne actually wrote in the music. So you can take that and you can apply that to pretty much any 20th and 21st century music that you're learning. I want to look at a couple of odd time signatures in here. So um, on the second page, you have the time signature of 16-8, which when I first learned this piece, I was like, wow, look at me. I'm so cool. I'm playing something that has 16-8 in it. It's really actually not that impressive. Um, if you remember from back in the days when you were learning, music for the first time. The number on top is the number of beats per measure. The number on the bottom is what kind of note gets that number of beats, right? So 16 meaning 16 beats per measure. Eight means that the eighth note gets the beat. So that all it's telling us is that there are 16 eighth notes worth of stuff in this measure. So if you count this out, it's all, th all 16th notes, which means there are 30 to 16th notes in the course of this measure. And when I interpret something like this, I try to keep consistency in one of the basic subdivisions of, of the piece unless the composer writes otherwise. So for example, the it switches from 3-4 time to 16-8 time. So when I interpret this, I think, okay, that means the eighth note pulse from the 3-4 time becomes the eighth note pulse in the 16-8 time. Now we do have to contend with the tempo change. There's a ritenuto and then a stringendo throughout the measure. So there is some flexibility in how slow and fast you play the 16-8 measure. But just so you know, don't freak out. It's not really that fast and 92 to the quarter note is manageable. You got this, you can do this. So, okay, so it's not, it's not as scary as it looks. The other time signature that throws everybody off is on the last page where it says five and a half, four. I'm sorry, I think that is like very silly and if you're a composer and you're watching this and, and, and you think it's cool to write weird half time signatures, great, good for you. Um, basically that is 11-8 and in my mind I just I just cross that out and I write 11-8 because there are 11 eighth notes in the measure so 
If I'm subdividing that eighth note pulse in the back of my head, it makes all of those 16th notes a lot more manageable. And that's it, okay? And lastly, this isn't a weird time signature. It's just a really, really weird way to write this rhythm. rhythm. Um, measure 58 and measure, measure 60. It has these eighth notes barred together in one big triplet bracket. And if you look at this and you break it down, okay, so when you see a triplet bracket over beats three and four, because that's what's happening here, this is beats three and four, and I know this because the first half of the measure, there's a double dotted quarter note, which means it's one and three quarters beats long, and that 16th note takes care of the other quarter of the beats. So we've got two beats already accounted for. We're in four, four times. So we have two beats left over. That is where this weird bracketed triplet thing comes in. All of that has to happen in the span of two quarter note beats. So these are written in eighth notes. Normally you see brackets like this over groups of quarter note triplets, right? That's essentially what is here. But you know what a more familiar subdivision of triplets is that we do a lot? Just regular eighth note triplets. So I want you guys to think about it more like this, you know, the whole measure. Instead of trying to do any other weird thing. And if you want it to not sound too much like you're doing actual eighth note triplets, just change how you accent the groups of the two eighth notes. Does that make sense? At the end of the day, all it has to do is sound and that's it. <laughs> so that's pretty much it in terms of weird time signatures and weird rhythms. Keep that that um, pulse going whenever you change time signatures. Just make sure the eighth note stays consistent or the quarter note stays consistent from one time signature to another and then you'll have consistency over the duration of the piece. So that advice is going to help you out when you're in measure 61, which is the cadenza. It wasn't labeled cadenza. There's nowhere in here, but if you look at it, there are way too many beats for it to actually be a 4-4 measure. Thus, it is a cadenza. So, this cadenza, you start out slowly, stringendo, and then little stringendo, meaning speeding up. So you speed up, speed up, speed up. Once you get to the stentando, start subdividing eighth notes. Them. then you can really slow down and have a very consistent slowdown of your 16th notes instead of just kind of flailing wildly and not really knowing what to do. So keep track of where you are. Triple it. All right, and I have four different musical terms that I want to make sure I define for you. Everything else in here is pretty straightforward. You've probably come across most of these musical terms in here, so just look through it carefully. But these four, I think, are a little less common. One is encalzando, which means pressing forward urgently, whatever you have to do to make it sound that. Whether it means to rush a little bit, play with a brighter sound, little crescendo, that kind of... Um, communicating of urgency is is what we want to do if we see in calzando. The next musical term is stentando, which means it's very similar to retardando, dragging, slowing, a bit more stretched out. The third is patatico, which I'm not sure if I say that right, but anyway, uh, you can probably guess pathetically. It's derived from, I think, probably the same Latin roots um, how do you play something pathetically? That's for you to decide. I prefer to make it sound a little bit softer, a little bit slower, a little bit defeated. At this point in the music, it's kind of toward the end of the piece, and so I want it to just sound like I'm almost done. And the last word, <clears throat> my favorite. Retrospectivamente, which means retrospectively. 
how do you make something sound like you're looking back onto the past? Well, that's for you to interpret, but I want it to sound like things are winding down. Everything is coming to an end. Also somewhat defeated, right? So it's a great piece to practice musical interpretation of 20th century music, kind of a good introduction to this kind of musical playing. So if you have any questions, if you have anything you'd like to add, please leave them in the comments below so we could all learn from each other. In the meantime, I hope you guys have a great time learning this piece. I think a lot of you, if you don't already know this piece, will really have a good time learning it. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, a nice week next week, and as always, happy practicing.